Okay, welcome everybody. This is Bill Hartman here. Hopefully he's in the center of your screen, like he's in the center of my screen. Uh, Christopher Wykus, you look great. <laughs> um, just quick rules real quick. Uh, if you're not talking, please mute your mic because if it comes out of your, uh, your speakers, it sends us a little feedback and the Zoom app shuts whoever else is talking down so that we can hear your background noise. So just keep it muted if you're not talking. Um, other than that, most things go. Uh, if we have a question that we can't answer, Bill will just tell you, I can't answer that right now. Maybe we can talk about it later next time I see you. Who here might have a question? I'm looking at you. <laughs> Um, hey, can you just hear me? What? I can. David? Uh, um, right, well, I just wasn't sure. Um, oh. I think it was, it was Steve and you, you, you beat me to it, so you asked the first question. Uh, I, I've been kind of looking at the upper airway a lot recently, trying to figure out what's going on up there. Yeah. Um, the palate descends with inhalation, is that right? Um, yes. Yeah. So, so you have an approximation of the back of your tongue with the soft palate. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you can think of that much like the diaphragm's approximation to the rib cage. Okay. So that, that's a term that you would use for that. It would be apposed. That's okay. only with nasal breathing, right? Yes, sir. Um, yeah, because otherwise it has to stay open, right? The tongue has to, the tongue, the tongue can't be in its, in its normal inhalation position. Otherwise your airway is blocked. Mm -hmm. AKA um, you're snoring. Yeah. <laughs> Are there ever times where you would use a, 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 an oral breathing strategy versus a nasal breathing strategy? Like, is there outside of, outside, outside of fatigue, like, well, if your um, nose is blocked, yeah, <laughs> you're not going to really have a choice. Um, you would you would you would try to drive the nasal breathing for for you know numerous reasons from mechanical to chemical, right? Because I want that I want that mechanism to be intact, um, because that that is the the normal resting breathing mechanism and if you think about things like nitric oxide that you have to inhale that's produced inside your 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 nasal passages the only way you're going to get that is to breathe through your nose okay and, and so that is a, a nat natural vasodilator natural relaxant kind of a thing that we can take advantage of as well and so again we have to have the nasal breathing a nasal breathing available to us what what muscles are responsible for pulling the palate down during inhalation? I don't know. If, let me think. It's been a long time since I looked at this, bro. Um, I'm not even sure. Um, is it is is tensor valley palatini one of them? I, I think I'm I'm just kind of okay. starting to get into the muscles of Mr. Mr. Anatomist. I really don't know. I'm. I, I think the main mechanism is thought to be the tongue pushing up. It'd be the pressure. So, so you, have, you, have, you have the pressure of inhalation. You've got the tongue position that, 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 that approximated it. But I'm just wondering if, if Palatini would, would uh, provide some element of positioning or stabilization associated with that. But, um, it's been a long time since I've even looked at that. Okay. So I, I can't speak with any measure of intellect. So I apologize for that. I could probably grab a book here real quick and find it, but uh, I don't want to waste any, any time on that. Yeah, I can let you know. Are it, there, uh, kind of going hand in hand with, with that, are there, I guess, any times that you use resisted inhalation with patients? I haven't in a, in a very long time. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a book called Respiratory Muscle Training. Um, and they use a lot of the, the uh, resisted breathing. Um, in fact, they use things like TheraBand on accessory muscles and, and such to, to sort of drive some of that. 
Um, there was a study that came out of Northeastern University where they did resisted breathing, which is actually a really cool, cool little study that they, they did with their hockey team. And the thing that, that they noticed when they, when they look at the, the respiratory measures, the, the mechanical components that, that they could measure as far as the airflow were not significantly different, but what changed was perceived exertion. And, and, and you're talking about a four point difference, I believe was in the perceived exertions for, so the difference I think was like a 15 at, at their, at their max. So they're, they're running hockey shifts. Lance, what's standard hockey shift? 40 seconds ballpark? 30 ish, 30, 40. Yeah. So they're running, they're running hockey shifts and, and I think they were in game situations and they had them rating perceived exertion as to how hard they were working. And, um, when, once these guys are training, now they're training for like a half an hour, three times a week. So that's a lot of training, right? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the perceived exertions went down significantly to the point that when they took the resisted breathing training away to see how long the effect was retained, the players were requesting to get back on it because it seemed to make everything so much easier. So there's, there's probably an element of, of respiratory effort associated with that. So just think about, you know, even the diaphragm itself can be trained, right? Mm -hmm. and, and in many cases, a lot of these people that you see as patients are actually deconditioned. And that's one of the limiting factors in them actually performing some of these respiratory-based activities is that they just don't have the, the muscular endurance to maintain a good pattern. So mm -hmm. and oftentimes you'll have, you'll have to adjust that. So... Um, but I don't do, I, I don't do like the, the resisted inhalation stuff. I can't think of the last time I did it. It's usually not the, the limiting factor in the people that I see, but I can see a performance related advantage to it. Yeah. I, I guess what I was thinking of is I, I haven't tried it on a specific patient yet, but, um, once you have the lower rib, rib cage secured, I was reading about pulmonary stretch restriction pulmonary stretch receptors and Correct. how that how that um with the lungs filling it actually quiets down some of the neck muscles that are used to pull in air right, right. Um, but, but, but the way that you're going to do that in most cases is by altering the the shape of the thorax to to reduce the pressures to allow the pressures to go where they don't so so you ask yourself why did the neck start to kick in, in the first place because it had to right mm -hmm. so how do you reduce that you, you reduce the pressure. So a lot of people are creating expiratory pressure in areas of the thorax so they don't suffocate because they have to make some room somehow. They have to get the air out somehow so they can breathe yeah. back in. And so the, the question then becomes, well, how do I reduce the, the pressures inside the thorax? And you can do that with positioning and muscle activity, and that's usually how you're going to do it. Um, but, but, yeah, you get your fast and your slow uh, 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 stretch receptors that you're dealing with as well. I, I, I wonder, if, um, again, it's been a long time since, since I've read about this stuff. Some of the coughing that you see with, with some of your patients, I think are associated with, a, with, with some of the stretch receptors. Um, in addition to this, maybe some, some of the, uh, clearing the dead spaces and such, but, but I think some of the, the coughing, if memory serves, they were associating that with, uh, with some of the stretch receptors that get activated during certain types of, of breathing, especially with, with folks that, that don't exhale on a regular basis and then inhale afterwards. That's usually what's driving that. Okay, cool. Thank you. And yeah, don't quote me on that stuff. It's been a long time since I've read it. So I apologize. That's okay. Chris, you want to bring your question out? Let's see what? John? Yeah, I mean, I was going to ask this question totally unrelated to his question. So I don't know if other people have questions yeah, have in relation to that. First. I don't really yeah, know, Chris, dude. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I was speaking with someone about forced in inhalation the other day, and they work at an exercise. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. They work at an exercise phys lab in Portugal, and he was explaining nice. to me something about forced inhalation and athletes pushing back metabol reflex at the level of the muscle. So that would, like – override central governance i don't know what the mechanism is though do you have any would you have any like theory or idea about that you're talking about forced inhalation yeah training a forced inhalation in an athletic so you were saying that rpe changed yeah yeah so maybe, maybe it's it's that but like what 
you think it's a stretch reflex thing? Do you think it's like the actual biochemical effects of fatigue interplaying with the central governance? Like, you know what? And, and you're going to hate this answer. I got a feeling it's not going to be like one thing. I think yeah, you're going to have a combination of factors. But, but, but think about this. So think about, um, just think about, you could get right down into like, like uh, intramuscular pH if you really want to get technical with it. When you think about fatigue-related um, uh, uh, byproducts. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 so if, if I can enhance... The, the endurance capabilities of any of the respiratory muscles that I might rely on, then, then what you're going to see is it, was it type three receptors give you the, the, the internal environment sort of, you know, measuring stick of what's going on. If you can influence that to any degree. So think about like, you know, proton accumulation in, in the muscle itself, that's going to, it's going to skew pH towards, towards acidic. If I can delay that on any level, then then surely the perceived exertion is going to change, and you're going to extend endurance at the same time. Right. And and again, I think from from an athletic performance standpoint, maybe you can impact that. Um, it's going to be something that you're going to if you do train it to a level, you're going to have to figure out some way to maintain that again. So does it take away from from something else? Is it is it necessary? you know, and useful, or is it just a really cool thing that we can manipulate? And you, you have to kind of make that decision for yourself, obviously. Right. Um, you know, and, and again, who are we talking about and what context are we using it and what sport are we using it? Does it change the overall uh, ability to perform? Or again, is it just something that we can reproduce in a lab that could potentially enhance performance, but it just doesn't have a, a, a strong applicability? You know, and those are the questions that we would have to ask, but, but I wouldn't doubt that for a minute. Also, um, I, I've always, I've been meaning to ask you this for a while. I, in Magnus's book, the science of running, he talks about a limiting factor being pulmonary capillarization. Is there a way to train that? Would, would that be forced or inhalation or exhalation? Or is that just something that you might have genetically? Well, you can never deny genetics, right? Cause I mean, you look at some of the VO2 stuff, the, you know, some people are just predisposed and, and, um, you know, you have, you have the perfect storm of somebody that <clears throat> they, you know, uh, the ability to, to buffer hydrogen ions and, and, uh, um, you know, have increased capillarization and then they just happen to fall in love with running and then they, they run a lot. And so I don't know, that's a really good question. I would think that, that there would be some element of, of a tr just a true training effect and it's yeah. it's nothing that I've, I've delved into a great deal because i just don't deal with it in, in my perspective i don't deal with it too much um but it, you know that's an interesting question because we talk about you know intramuscular all the time right and, yeah. and if you can enhance that we we know there's a there's a, a performance related enhancement associated with that i don't know i don't know how much of that is a limiting factor i'll have to go back to magnus's book yeah, I just remember it being just one sentence in the book talking about potential limiting factors to aerobic performance. I don't remember the exact quotation, but I have I read I wrote down something in my notes about like how can we influence pulmonary capillarization, and I wasn't really sure how. I tell you what, my I I tell you I I tell you what I'll do, Chris. If you send me a note, um, and it, I will look up. I I have two other resources that I that I can think to look in, and that's um. Um, endurance performance, and, and I never say his name right, um, and I'm not even going to attempt to say it. And then um, Tim Noakes' running book might have it yeah. too, because that's about three inches thick of just a mass of information. Okay. And since he's the central governor guy, maybe he's a, he's looked into it. Okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah, I have other questions on aerobic development, but I don't want to like hold everybody's time, so maybe I'll cycle out and then. No, we can always do that. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm just interested to know why John O'Neill is, is, is so comfy in his robe. Well, we're both it, Jedi. <laughs> it seems, it seems so early in the evening to, to be in the smoking jacket, you know, I mean, this is a robe too. <laughs> is it really? Yeah. I'm, I'm all from work on Wednesdays. So real clothes may or may not get on all day. Uh, <laughs> I, stay, I, stay, I stay home and I wear this most of the day. So. All right. John, did you have a specific question, young man? You, 
Or were you trying to get Chris on? Yeah, I did. Um, no, uh, I had a question in relation to assessing a thrower, a uh, baseball pitcher. Uh, when you have, when you see some kind of valgus carrying angle, um, uh-huh. is your first thought, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take note of this or I'm going to change this or I'm going to try to um, actually put a dent in making this worse? Or sorry, not in not making this worse. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, like right off the bat, um, you, you know, you're, you're thinking first and foremost, like the level of the pitcher. Uh, if you're going to see that, then, then it may be an element of his performance. And, and to be honest with you, John, I think I look at almost all this stuff as, as you know, uh, the, the N equals one concept as far as how they're producing things. The thing that I get most concerned with, and, and I can narrow this down specifically, is a left-hander with uh, a predominance of uh, external rotation in the humerus and a limitation in internal rotation, and then excessive supination, because that's what gaps that medial elbow. When you think about like the extreme, uh, the, the transition from uh, end cocking phase as, as they start to bring the, the body forward, and it just opens up that medial elbow, that's where I get kind of concerned. Um, whether you can change it significantly or not is always the question mark. And so I look at it as a management process. You know, if they're asymptomatic um, and, and they're sort of clean elsewhere, I don't get as concerned because now you've got a body that's got a lot of variability in it. So when you're talking about the consistency as a pitcher to hit a release point. It's, it's a matter of how much variability do they have below the position of the ball, right? So uh, can, how many different adjustments can I possibly make to hit the release point consistently, or at least as consistently as possible. If I see somebody with a whole lot of stuff going on and then I see the, the, the valgus at the elbow where I see the, the uh, hyperextension on the medial aspect of the elbow that goes along with it, then I might be a little bit more concerned and say, okay, this is secondary to the rest of the body, but we need to make sure that we're monitoring this closely. You know, when, when somebody's asymptomatic, it's hard to, hard to, I mean, we can't predict, you know, who's going to be what from an injury standpoint. We like to think that we, that we do, but I think if you look at the whole picture, then maybe like it raises the level of concern a little bit more but you're always going to you know attack the the variability in the body anyway but i wouldn't just look at the the elbow uh in isolation and and say oh he's got a valgus we need to you know do something i think you have to look at everything before you before you jump to any conclusions their their history will tell you too it's like how much medial elbow do you pain do you have on a regular basis and they say i've never had it and then you see this adaptation, maybe it's not a concern. It doesn't mean I wouldn't follow it, right? You establish a baseline with everybody that you work with, and then you're always making the comparisons on an ongoing basis. And if you can catch them at different times, especially after they've thrown, so you get a sense of what type of change do they make when they fatigue. Um, you, you can speak with the, the coaches as long as they speak your language a little bit and they don't just speak baseball, um, that always helps. But uh, again, I, I don't think that, that just looking at it in isolation is enough information to get concerned or, or to not be concerned. Right. Yeah, thank you. That answers it. Got interns sitting there all bored. Look at them. Hello, interns. Do you guys have a question? Are you still too young to have questions? Hey, Bill, can you guys hear me? Yes. There he is. Hey, I've got a question. Are you on a bike? I've just gotten off of work. <laughs> yeah. Trying to do something today. So. In my clinic, I'm fairly limited in terms of resources for performance, um, specifically like lower extremity stuff, like lunges, step-ups. I'm doing stuff like that. 
Um, but I'm looking for, I guess, more uh, more activities once these patients have got variability. And I'm trying to build up their capacity without, you know, screwing them up essentially. So, what's your question? Can't hear you, dude. I can't hear you. You hear me now? Yes. Okay. So I guess, is there any specific, like, if I'm doing a squat, like, you want to keep the hamstrings engaged. Um, is there any specific hamstring activities you like um, for, like, performance stuff? Or do you just like making sure, um, you know, the client's in a, in a good position so that, you know, everything's working together nicely? Just looking for, for hamstring related activities? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, hamstring activities are just lower extremity activities okay. that are going to enhance variability or okay. help maintain variability. Well, you're just talking about progressing um, load, capacity, power, et cetera, et cetera, right? Yeah, right. yeah. Okay. Have you taken them through like some sort of hamstring progression, like a bridge progression? Um, a full spectrum of contract contraction, like eccentrics, isos, concentric, eccentric, related stuff. You've done all that? My go-to for that has been kind of in the 90-90 position, do the bridge, you know, and on the way up, or exhale way up, and on the way down with the eccentric, concentric there. Okay. So you can... You can do isometrics throughout that, that full range of motion. You can emphasize the duration of the concentric or the eccentric. You can go faster. You can go to single leg. Um, you can change the angle. You can change the, the, the degree of excursion. Um, there's there's you know, a number of different ways that, that you can do that. The only thing that, that I request that you never, ever do is a stool scoot. Um, otherwise, you'll be disowned. Um, but I mean, that, that gets you kind of started. And then if you want to spend, you know, 10 bucks on some furniture movers, now you got a, something you can slide across the floor, um, you know, like a, like a slide board to, to enhance that. And then everything else becomes sort of like a, you know, a developmental progression. Can they work in half kneeling? Can they come out of half kneeling? Um, and then you're, you're into, you know, bilateral, symmetrical, bilateral, asymmetrical. So play with stances you know, driving upper body on top of that, all that stuff enhances what you're trying to do. Because remember that, that you're not just thinking about lower extremity, you're, you're thinking about management of the, of the pressures inside the axial skeleton. And, and that's what really we're, we're trying to manipulate in many of these cases. And, and once you can do that, then the strength and the power tends to, to you know, improve all by itself without a tremendous amount of overload unless you're dealing with an athlete that has to reach a certain level of conditioning, it may not even be necessary. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Most of my stuff I've been doing on that standpoint, power capacity standpoint has been from, uh, from your book, but I was curious if you had any other thoughts on that. So. It, I mean, it's, it's difficult when you don't have, you know, resources, but, Again, all, all that's missing is, is a little, little creativity, right? You need some space, and you need some space to move. But if you, if, you, know, if you play with, with range of motion, speed, contraction type, I mean, right there, there's, there's three different options. Take one exercise, and, and you've turned it into four exercises. And, and we, we, we underappreciate that, that, that component. There's many ways to create an, an overload, you know, and uh, just time alone, just, you know, change the tempo. There's another one. Um, I'm trying to remember the, uh, uh, the Mel Siff comment in regards to the, uh, the statute of fitness limitations. He, he goes through about eight or nine different ways to manipulate uh, the, the uh, exercise. And then you've got seven, seven 
components of force. Right, Lance? Do you remember the seven components of force? Uh, no. Magnitude, load, direction, duration, frequency, variability, and rate. So right there are seven different ways to manipulate an exercise. So there are many ways to do it. You just, again, have, have a, a, a list ahead of time of, of the potential exercises that you can do. Have a list of the ways that you can manipulate that exercise. So these are, these are your it depends, these are your if thens, and this is your supply chain phenomenon where you have a predetermined menu to choose from, and then as you as you go through your interventions and you're reassessing on your outcomes, to determine what to do next. Now you have a list to draw from to at least give you some ideas to provide some creativity and some direction as to how you're going to do it. So, you know, you could have a list of 20, 25 different ways to manipulate a, a situation, you know, take one exercise and, and tweak it any number of ways to make it novel and interesting and alter the load and alter the, the, uh, uh, the dimensional loading from, you know, whatever plane you want to work in. And, and like I said, tempos and range of motion and the contraction type, all of them, use them all. Who else has a question? One of the interns raised their hand. Oh, wait, I hear someone. Is that Eric? Eric said thank you, by the way. I don't know if you caught that. Oh, okay. So, so I have a question. Um, how do you correlate infraspinal, uh, sorry, infrasternal angle with mutation in the pelvis? So I guess meaning, you know, if you have a wide infrasternal angle being extended above the pelvis and having a narrow being extended in, within the pelvis, can you just kind of ex explain and connect those dots for us? You mean, how do I know that they correlate? Yeah, like what, what through your exam or testing, do you, are you going through to, to double check that, that those, like that matches up? Okay. Um, so here's, here's what you're doing. You're trying to identify what phase of respiration some specific segments of the body are in. And, and so you have tests that will tell you where variability is lacking. So for instance, if I am, if I'm either mutated or counter mutated and cannot achieve the opposing movement, hip adduction is limited. Okay, so whether the sacrum is mutated or counter mutated, if it cannot achieve the opposing movement, hip adduction is limited in most cases. So that tells me that they're stuck in one phase of respiration before I even know which one it is. Now, and you can just shake, shake your head since you're, you're muted right now. Um, do you know what position the, the, the lower ribs should be for an inhalation? You know the bucket handle concept? <laughs> yeah. Okay, would it be a bucket handle up or a bucket handle down for inhale? Up. Oh. Up, oh. okay, good. So, so if, if the bucket handle is up, then I know that the, the rib cage is in, a, is in a position, the anterior ribcage is in a position of inhalation. Based on where the extension occurs in the spine, when the, when the uh, uh, sacrum is nutated, so it's forward, it's tipped forward, so the, the base of the, the sacrum is flexed forward, that widens the infrapubic angle, so those two angles kind of match up. However, they're in different phases of respiration. And that's a problem. So I have an axial skeleton 
that's actually positioned in a position of exhalation, if I cannot access a position of inhalation, I have to compensate. And that's what matches up the angle. So I have a pelvis that is exhaled and I have an anterior rib cage that is now inhaled against a body that is in a position of exhalation. That's a problem. Because now I can't access both, both ends of the spectrum. So the whole body moves through inhalation, exhalation. Um, and, and, and that's what we're measuring. That's what we use as our foundational measure. That's what we're trying to achieve is a body that can move through both phases fully. So it's not just about, can I move air in and out? Most people can, under most circumstances, where they'd be dead, right? But if I have a body that wants to stay exhaled, I have to find a way to inhale against it. Okay? And so the pelvic position, and the sacral position, actually, so it's the sacrum, and, and the position of the thorax will tell me what phases what phase they're in and what phase that they have to compensate to get into. And then that's what drives my decision making. So the wide infrasternal angle matches up to the wide infrapubic angle, but I got a, I got a spine and, and, or the axial skeleton that's trying to be always exhaled and I found a way to inhale against it. And that's what drives a lot of the movement problems. That's what alters the shape of the thorax and limits the movement in the first place. It alters where I can put air pressure inside the thorax, and that alters how I have to change the intra-abdominal pressure, and that's what alters the position of the sockets, and that's what screws up the extremity position. So it's a cascade of effects, but it's all based on the ability to move the entire body through the phases of respiration. Now, this is all a secret, so don't tell anybody. All right, sounds good. Thank you. Hey, quick question off that. Um, so if someone, you say someone's hyperinflated, can you say that regardless of a narrow or wide infrasternal angle or because of the, the phase of reps, phases of respiration are different? You cannot say that regardless of its narrow or wide. Eric, you have my permission to say anything you want. I would say that, that the two, if we talk about the extreme positions of the infrasternal angle, I would not say that they are both hyperinflated. Now that doesn't mean that they're not both trapping air, but when you think about inflation, we're talking about about inhalation, I would think that, that your wide infrasternal angles would be, would be more, more of a, uh, a inhalation consideration. Whereas the, you know, we think bucket handle up is inhale, bucket handle down is exhale. Well, if the, if the infrasternal angle is narrow, that's a down bucket handle. So, so that's a thorax that found a way to exhale against an inhaled body. So they're trapping air they're not hyperinflated. They created so much pressure so quickly that they trapped air in the alveoli and the muscle recruitment pattern allowed them to do that because of the position of the thorax. So if we think of hyperinflation, you know, maybe you'll have higher stress, higher anxiety type of thing. So with a narrow angle, obviously you could still see those symptoms in someone, but if we're looking just at the, the angle, you might be less likely to see an anxiety or stress in that person, potentially because of the pH. Well, yeah, I mean, you're, you're gonna have a whole series of physiological sequelae that, that are associated with, with any sort of uh, limitation in the, in the respiratory cycle. But, but let me offer you this in regards to like the stress and anxiety and, and such. If I have you exhale fully and don't allow you to ever inhale again, would that cause stress? Okay, if I allow you to inhale fully but never allow you to exhale, would that cause stress? Of course. So it doesn't matter. 
The point is, is that you have you have a body that that does not have the capability of of the full excursion of inhalation to exhalation and the associated uh, uh, movement that is required to do so. Bill, I have one quick question. Uh, last time I saw you, uh, you mentioned the concept of vertical integration. Uh, I was just wondering where I can learn more about that, what resources you uh, come to mind in terms of reading. Charlie Francis, Derek Hansen, right. Charlie Francis. So, so um, it, it, it's actually based off of, you know, I mentioned supply chain management a little bit ago. Um, the vertical integration uh, is, is, an, is a sort of like an industrial concept, um, which, which again, anytime we, we talk about planning, Right. Any any type of, of, of uh, programming or planning is they're all based off of of these uh, business like concepts. And and uh, but Charlie Francis is, is the guy that sort of brought that to the forefront and probably um, gave some of the best representations of that. Um, I'm trying to think of is it. I'm trying to think of it's the Vancouver seminar, which you can actually buy um, off the uh, Charlie Francis site. I think it's the Vancouver seminar where he, he lays it out and, and you can actually get the slides in a PDF and it's a great representation of that. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's, I'm pretty sure it's the Vancouver seminar. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I had some other questions. Fire away, man. Um, so we're uh, back on the aerobic development thing. So we, uh, Bill, you and I both went to the Omega Wave seminar in Connecticut, right? Were yeah. you, were you, was yeah. that when I met you? Yeah. So they, those guys talk a lot about adapt, aerobic adaptations for type two fibers and then having the difference between sarcoplasmic adaptations and mild fibril adaptations. Do right. you have any idea what the mechanism are for each like I have I have some idea of maybe what's happening there but I don't even know if that's really what's going on or like where how they determine this to begin with do you have any idea yeah I, well it, it Lance is that the Solana stuff Soliana yeah yeah I think that's where most of it comes from yeah I don't know how much actual uh, direct measurement was done I don't know if they did biopsies and such but um, here's here's my understanding of, of that, Chris. Is that you're actually trying to hypertrophy? You're actually trying to create the physical size of of the slow twitch fibers versus increasing directly increasing the aerobic capability. So basically, you're trying to make a bigger fiber. Fast, um, fast twitch, fast. Twitch. Are you talking about fast fast twitch, or are you talking about slow twitch? Yeah, talking about talking about trying to get as much out of the white fiber as I can because oh, okay. there sorry. are mitochondria in there. Yeah. Totally so the, the question was more. So the idea was the idea that as far as I can grasp, it seems that the more reactive the method for the explosive activity that you're doing, the more sarcoplasmic the myochondrial biogenesis is. And I don't know if that has to do with calcium channels, but right. And then, then the myofibril is more like high resistance and high intensity continuous type of stuff to, to try to pack it into the white fiber. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I don't know. So, so here's here's my only concern when when you when you talk about the like sort of segmenting the hypertrophy, if you will, like 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 one type versus another. Um, if you read about a concept called myonuclear domain, so what that is, so you know that you have, you have multiple nuclei for the for a muscle fiber, they're 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 multinucleated, right? Okay. And, and the reason being is, is because each of these nuclei are responsible for a certain amount of area and volume inside of a muscle cell. And so they can only, they, so that's why we need multiples because the, the complexity of the muscle cell, the size of the cell itself and, and, and the, the, the volume. And, and I, I think it's an area based concept. 
And again, man, we're talking about stuff I haven't read about in a long time. Um, <laughs> I think it's an area-based concept. And I don't think, I don't think it's necessarily distinguishable because, because I think there's a certain amount of sarcoplasm that has to be associated with a certain amount of, of myofibril development. So there's like a percentage based association. So if I, you know, if I have like, you know, a 2% gain in, in myofibril content, then I have to have a certain, certain amount of, of uh, sarcoplasmic content to go with it, to support it. And so I don't know if it's, if it's even possible to like skew it in one direction or, or another. And I, and, and I think that, and again, I just remember being associated with the, the, the myonuclear domain concept. Um, man, I got to go back and read some of this stuff. This, you're asking hard questions tonight. Um, <laughs> I thought I hit you with some of those. In a while. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, the, the most, the best thing I could get out of my research, my very limited research, was that the mitochondria seem to exist in high densities near calcium ion channels. So when you have these repeated contraction and relaxation cycles, right. having more calcium available is helpful via the mitochondrial action. I don't, I don't know. I really don't know. That was the best I got. I don't know if you had any idea of other mechanisms. Well, you know what? Hang on a second. So I don't know where they even distinguish these things from. Did they, and I don't know if they did biopsies. I don't know that's, if like, that's my question. I don't, I I guess don't know how you would. Even we're sort of flying that. by the seat of our pants, and, and we're and we're taking someone's opinion because we we may not have a counter argument. And, and right. That's, exactly. That's always, that's always the challenge. Is we sort of have to accept it until we we have something to sort of say. Well, but maybe not. Well, that's um, what I was hoping you had for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, and again, I. But I, I'm, I'm what I tell you what I'm thinking about when you brought up calcium. You brought up calcium channels, right? Calcium ion channels, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I wonder if it has something to do with the structured water and and the the um, the way that the. Uh, let me think. What it may be, what it may be, is is the way that the the water is actually structured, in association with with the, the ions, because what the ions will do is, is they'll skew the charge in a, in, a, in a certain direction, and that's gonna cause the water to structure in a certain way in regards to how much protein content you have, and maybe that's what skews the perspective of the sarcoplasmic content versus um, you know, having like a massive increase of one, because it, what it might be is that, so the, the you know, the nature of the proteins will, will structure the water, the charges that are associated um, with, with, the, with the ions within the muscle cell will also structure the water in a certain way. And that influences where the water goes and then how densely packed it is. And, and I wonder if that has something to do with it. And again, this is just me talking off the top of my head yeah, yeah. and thinking about Change the it. gradient. Like that yeah, is modern yeah, gradient. Essentially what it is. Yeah. But 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 literally you're 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 changing the, the the water becomes structured, not like a solid, but it's more like a more like a gel, so it's more compact under certain circumstances where in, in other circumstances, and again, depending on the ions and the attraction, um, so now we're talking we're talking cell physics, right? We're not necessarily talking that that you're 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 maybe increasing the content, but maybe just changing its position or 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 again where the uh, or the, the way that the protein is organizing it i wonder if that has something to do with that that would be a really interesting thing to look at um there's a there's a a, a book by um by pollock from a long time ago i think it was 1990 muscles and molecules um and i know he talked about some of that in there okay yeah i'll um, look into that yeah um, Myonuclear domain thing I'll look into too. That's interesting. Well, that's it. That, that's know, just a, did like um, did right. Akuviro get into any of that stuff with like his adaptation for training uh, literature? Have you read most of his stuff, Vero? Well, I got the adaptations book up on the shelf here. Um, and again, it's been a long time since I looked at that, but I don't I don't recall him making a big distinguishing remark in that in that respect. Um, yeah, I'm just, you know, just and, obnoxious, and, and I want to know more. But again, it, 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 
it, it seems to be something that's, that's somewhat prolific in the thought process. I mean, it's, it goes all the way back into the, I think the first edition of super training when Mel Siff was talking about sarcoplasm yeah. versus, versus the myofibril. And Joel, Joel talks about it in the book. Yeah. But but again, not to that extent that we're talking we perpetuating something because we just don't have a better argument against it. You know? Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 I don't know if it's the truth or not. I don't know how much it, how much it matters. I don't think it does either. I just want to, I just am annoying and want to know. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, because it's all going to be like specific adaptation to whatever activity you're doing, right? So what again, doesn't again, really matter, the outcome is the same. Infinitely yeah. more important, infinitely more important yeah. than than to struggle over yeah. that. But okay. again, it's it's interesting stuff to know and to to research and to and to try to understand. And if anything, what it does is it is it gives you sort of a. Uh, uh, a, an argument to support why you're doing something other than right. just the plain old outcome, which is perfectly fine with me, right? If we, if we just get, get the, the outcome that we desire, who cares the, you know, the ultimate reason that's for the researchers to figure out and to catch up with what the coaches are already finding uh, being effective. Yeah. They're just going to tell you why it all. worked you know, not necessarily yeah. like what to do that to make it better. Cause they'll probably be wrong too. Yeah, all models are wrong, right? Correct. Thankfully. Yeah. There's nothing to talk about. Yeah, seriously. I mean, I have more stuff. I don't want to keep going on this, though, if anyone else has anything to say. I mean, I have more mitochondria questions, but... George, are you new, I'll, George? Tap, I'll George tap out. Know? Well, you can come back. Yeah, yeah I'm new to the Q&As, but I've been... Uh, I've okay. asked you for a while, yeah. I thought I've seen your name. Yeah. Okay. Where are you at? Uh, New York City. And we also spoke at Rand Phone's uh, seminar. Oh, that's right. About that, okay. Yeah. yeah, okay. I remember you now. I remember you now. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep, we talked to that one break. I remember. Yeah. Yep, 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 yep. Okay, cool. Cool. Well, if nobody has a question, Chris, fire away, man. This is fun. Can I ask a question real quick? No, absolutely not. Go ahead, Allison. Um, I was wondering if you have any specific literature about uh, the pH regulation and intracellular uh, pH regulation. I've been reading a lot about the stress management and stuff, um, and I've come across, like, reviewing old biomechanical works and stuff, like um, perturbation of ions and catalysts and stuff. Um, and I was wondering if you have any specific literature that's more anatomy-based or intracellular-based. Yeah. Um, do you have a medical phys book? I do not. Okay. Um, and, and you might be able to just actually search for this online. You're, you're looking at acid-base balance. You're going to have a, there's going to be a respiratory component to that, um, that, that will uh, uh, contribute to the management of pH. Um, exercise phys is going to take you through that. I mean, if you just look at, at the energy system um, sections, a lot of times they'll talk about um, the, the hydrogen ion production and that influences pH. So intracellular pH and then the, um, the circulatory pH as well will be affected by that. Obviously, um, type three, I think it's type three receptors that are, are Lance, can you help me out there? Is that type three receptor that, that, uh, um, takes the information that's the afferents from the muscle themselves i think from, it's from from the muscle themselves yeah so so the to, to so the brain recognizes the local muscular environment i think it's a type 3 receptor and so so you know when you talk about the, so the the burning and aching associated with muscle activity that we talk about you know like that people used to blame on lactic acid and such um, that that's probably a combination of, of factors, but it's mostly centrally driven because the, the nervous system, the brain especially, is recognizing the change in the internal environment. And so it's, it's becoming uh, more interesting and potentially threatening. And so it, it makes it hurt so you stop. Um, so, so that's an influence on all of that. Um, Tim Noakes, N-O-A-K-E-S, he's the central governor guy. So he's gonna probably have a lot on, on the uh, influence of the afferent information on the nervous system as far as performance goes. Bill, what was the name of the Noakes 
book that you mentioned earlier, the, the three inch one you were talking oh, about? Good God. It's, it's, and it's so simple, the title, and I can't remember. Is it, is it just like, it's something like running. I mean, it's, it's something like that simple. Um, you know, if you go to Amazon, you put in Tim Noakes, it's going to be the, the running book and it's going to be about 600 pages. It's going to be a really thick book. The lore of running. There you go. There you go. Thank you. Thanks, Lance. I got you. But, but, but Tim, Tim Noakes is rather prolific in regards to, uh, to, to uh, um, many things performance related from water intake to, uh, like I said, he, he's a, I think he's a runner himself. And so he got into that and, and, but he's the central governor guy. He's sort of the guy that brought that to the forefront. Right. Okay. Speaking of central governance, I have more questions about central governance. Can I pause your real Sure. Bill, do you have a, a medical phys and an ex phys book recommendation? Uh, medical phys boron b o boron o n. Um, I never remember the authors on the the white uh, phys oh. physiology of high performance. Okay, that one though. It's it's two guys with they starts with M's. Yeah, it's mm, like McMillan. It's yeah. McMillan or something. Mc, like McDougal. McDougal. Yeah, that sounds right. Somebody. One of those. Okay. Perfect. Uh, so speaking of, oh, there we go. Yep. McDougal. Okay. Thank you, John O'Neill. Yep. Down, yes. Yeah. 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 Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, John. Uh, McDougal and sale. Yep. So speaking of central governance. Yes. Oh, was that my, was that my cue? <laughs> To like you have to like point to me or something, Lance. It's, it's okay. I don't know um, if you can see my pointing. It's like when you're improvising on the guitar, uh, Chris, you always have to be ready to take it. Yeah, I'm, I'm more of a drummer. Okay, fair enough. Um, okay, so central governance. So okay. using very like supra high intensity methods to try like Joel Jameson call them cardiac power. We're trying to get uh -huh. some sort of myochondrial biogenesis of the myocardium, which is a pretty okay, fatigue sure. resistant. That's a lot of big words. I don't really understand, but go ahead. So mitochondria at the heart. If the, if the heart is like super endurance muscle, because if it fatigues, you die, then you need to have a lot of mitochondria there. I mean, I guess sure. that's like my thought process. So in yeah. order to drive more there, I need to exceed the capacity in a way that's going to drive adaptation because of the stress. Right. So... My question is, on top of that, there's some thinking, although I've spoken to Joel and he wasn't sure what it is that, that's actually affecting uh, mitochondria in the brain, in like the motor cortex, or maybe even like the hindbrain. Do you know anything about that? Wow. Um, nope. Okay. Yeah, that I mean, was, that, there was something that I took Joel's course and he taught, yeah. he like just kind of offhand said something about it and I spoke with him about it and he, was, he said it was pretty recent. In the research, yeah, I had, a, uh -oh. had something to do with how the lymphatic system affects the brain, or I, I don't know. I couldn't, I couldn't tell you. I thought maybe you would know. That no, no, I, I really wouldn't know. But th again, it might be one of those. So I guess really where, things, you know, to, to just kind of know. Where does the central governor is? It, have they centralized it to a part of the brain? Is it motor cortex? That we're, I, we're saying think, that that's the limiting factor. Is. Okay, so where where is? Mm -mm, mm -mm. It's a dynamic thing. If you if you look at if you look at at neurotags for for pain, anxiety, and depression, and all the stuff that they have sort of mapped, um, they're all over the place. I don't think there's a set. I don't know how centralized really anything can be right it's all patterns right 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 yeah These layers have, of patterns think about all the potential sensory influences that could that could determine whether you need to stop moving or exercising or performing or whatever you know if we're just talking about about yeah. the environment of exercise look at all those possible things i mean just the the visual space alone 
could be a deterrent to continue. Um, okay. So I don't think that, that you could ever say that there is like, oh, this structure is the central governor, right? Got it. Um, I, so I, what about, um, so increasing, if we're talking about different structures in the brain in regards to like threat deterrence and management of threat, are, is increasing mitochondrial density in the brain going to help just all together with that, in that like line of thinking? Well, I mean, you certainly have a potential for, I'm, I'm, go ahead. Yeah, I'm not even sure like what, what sort of level of uh, like acid and pH difference do I get across the blood brain barrier? Like, isn't that protective? Like, I, I don't you're, even you're know. Getting, you're getting into stuff that I just even have, haven't even looked at. Yeah, I, just, <laughs> okay. I don't know if it matters. It's just, I just have questions. You know, about Chris, stuff like why don't you ask me something cool about the sternum or, you know. <laughs> I, okay. <laughs> you want to talk about, uh, you want to talk about weird, like nondescript left shoulder pain? <laughs> you know, you know what I'm talking about? It's like, why does it hurt? I don't know. Yeah, it's like, it's like this thing and it's here, but but it's deep, but it's on the surface, and then it runs down my arm. Yeah, I, I have some people with that, yeah. and I don't know if you have a specific way you treat them other than like the common things like rib cage position and airflow, and then scapular position and movement. You ha I, so so there, there's a there's a hierarchy, right? So I want to eliminate the things that impact th the most systems. So so again, you just go through your hierarchy. And, and do they have this full excursion first and foremost? So, you know, people want to poo-poo biomechanics. It's like, but, but I got to eliminate that as, as an element. And based on my scope of practice, I rely on the biomechanics to provide me information as to, as to what I need to do. So before I, and, and I, get, I get that stuff too every day. You know, people say, why does it hurt? And I answer them honestly. I say, I don't know. And, and I say, but here's what we're finding. And then here's what I want to do. And then we'll see what happens because I don't know what will happen. And I don't know why it hurts. So, you know, we had a, we had a viola player in today, you know, that, that gets a whole bunch of, of nervy type symptoms when she plays for four hours at a time, which she has to do because she practices and she performs and then she does two performances a day and things like that. And, and uh, you know, we don't approach it any differently. You know, I might throw in, you know, if somebody presents with a, 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 a symptoms that appear to be, you know, uh, nerve related. So they draw me into this nice little line down their arm that, that happens to, to match up with one of the, the peripheral nerves. You know, I'll, I'll test the neurodynamics before I do anything. And then I'll intervene and then I'll test the neurodynamics after to see if we've impacted that, you know, and, and, you know, we're, we, we did well today. We, we did actually a really good job with her today and, and she, she left feeling better than she walked in. So that's good. But, but, you know, when you get these vague, you know, inconsistent kind of stuff, who knows? And even if we do get these patterned, like the, these, these things that sort of fall into the, to the, what the the rules, so to speak, of oh, it's this. This is your diagnosis. That sounds like an L5 disc problem. You know, we still don't even know, right? So you just treat with what what you got before you. You you assess the best you can. You did, you make a determination as to what you think needs to be done. You intervene and then you retest because we just don't know. Okay. Because your left your nondescript left shoulder pain might be something totally different than someone else's nondescript left shoulder pain. Right. So you don't find any commonalities at all. It's just, it's always just like, it could be anything. Yeah. I mean, I could, I could do tests. I could do the same test on two people and get a similar response and it could be something totally different in both of them. Right. You know, and that's, and, but, but that's, that's dealing with, with the complexity of a human. Because again, we, we have so many potential influences. We can't just look at structure. Okay. You know, I can't just look at some sort of special test that has, you know, the, the various levels of specificity and sensitivity and, and rely on that and, and say, okay, so, and, and so what if I do determine that, I, that so my special tests, I, I, I do three, three tests with, with reasonable 
specificity and sensitivity that, that, that point towards the structure? Does that change anything for what I will do as far as, as far as my intervention goes? I might protect them from something, but I'm still going to try to restore you know, variability to the system. You know, I can't, I can't physically, I've never physically altered a structure in my life, right? We don't think we can do that. We don't have any indication that we can. You know, I, I've never repaired a torn meniscus. I've never repaired a torn rotator cuff or a torn labrum or, or anything like that. I've, I've poked on, on muscles and skin and apparently fascia uh, injury. Hello? I lost oh, you froze. Did I froze? Yeah. I froze. Yeah. Did I do it again? So I lost the punchline. <laughs> yeah. You got to start over. Start over. Go, go back and start from the beginning again. So in the beginning, <laughs> it was dark. Let's talk about embryo. Let's talk about <laughs> developmental embryology. Oh, my gosh. Hey, how about the circulation inside the uh, embryo at the third week, huh? It's lateralized. Yeah, yeah. Go it's lateralized already. It's, it just keeps spinning to the... <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it always goes the same direction, huh? <laughs> hmm. there, there's actually... There's a energetic mechanism, I believe, in, in that's associated with, um, with the charges that, that, that initiates that. The what? I, I think I think I so. You. I think there's charges, like like again, the, the whole charged water thing is is fascinating to me. The, oh yeah, the, are you talking about right spin versus left spin? Yeah, that yeah. stuff's interesting, right? The yeah. things that are re the things that are like reactive seem to be right spinning. I think like the ones that you can actually use in reactions. The left yeah. spinning ones are more like inert. I, I don't. Are we talking cis and trans now? Yeah. Um, no, like Mike Mullen was introducing me to this idea of like when you, you take, if you, if you try to utilize certain um, like micronutrients and they have a certain spin to them, they, you can't utilize them in your system unless they're right spinning. Uh, yeah, well, so, like, right, so I'll have to look into this. Be an L versus a D? Yeah, L versus like, is it R or D? I think it's yeah. a D. Uh, okay. For dextro, yes. but for right, so it's it's an R for as well. Right. Okay. Yeah, Got so the, they're mirror images, and and one of them is 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 we're able to utilize, and the other one is inert, right? Yeah, the the right right spinning seems to be the one that you can use. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's that was interesting to me. Huh. Wow. The universe is spinning to the right. Well, we asked. We talked about some hard stuff tonight. I don't think I. I don't think I'm going to do this again. <laughs> yeah. So, sorry. <laughs> I, need to, I need to. I need to dive back into my my fizz books for the next one. If you're gonna, if we're gonna go this deep, man. Well, tell me what. Tell me what I'm allowed to ask and not ask. You can ask me and anything. I'll bring more. That I know the answer. <laughs> you know. I don't either. That's why I just I look to you, Bill. I'm not Bill Nye. You know, Bill Nye knows everything. <laughs> I don't think Bill Nye knows that either. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Bill, do you see the do you see the um you see the Batman anime with the Joker that's like in Japan and like feudal Japan? I have oh wait a minute. Oh man. Maybe did you did. see that the trailer yet? Someone must have posted that to you. I don't know. I go to Batman on film. Whatever he talks about is what I pay attention to. Oh, uh, okay. What was the name of that? You told me a website last time. I didn't write it down. With the suit, the guy that talks about superheroes and like the physics of Superman. What was the name of that website? The Imaginary Axis. The Imaginary Axis. His name Got is it. Tyler, and he'll tell you, "My name is Tyler, and this is the Imaginary Axis." Nice, nice, nice. Yeah, it's really good. It's fascinating. Yeah, I love stuff like that. I think that I think the call's over. We're talking about superheroes. Oh, yeah, I feel a little anticlimactic, but I feel like it worked out. <laughs> Do we have time for one more question? Give me quick. I I would be glad to.
Awesome. Thank you. Um, I know the answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's as complicated as Chris's. I hope not, at least. Okay. Um, we're right. seeing uh, kind of a big influx of guys with uh, who have either had thoracic outlet surgery or complain about symptoms and every doctor they see is like, oh, this is, these are thoracic outlet syndromes. And then it puts it in the kid's head and they're freaking out about it. Um, what, uh, I guess we only have a few minutes, but what comes to mind that we should be looking more, for more aggressively uh, in terms of preventing that from happening, put it that way. Okay, All right. So we're talking about the space between the clavicle and the first rib. And so anything that involves that area so so your measurements in that area will, will sort of guide you as to what to do um, i've seen it a lot in swimmers we had we've had two or three swimmers probably within a year that came in all with very very similar um, thoracic outlety kind of symptoms and didn't respond to, to the traditional therapy stuff um, but but that that's a big deal. And you think about the, the mobility that they need to achieve certain things. So so butterfly um, tends to be a big culprit because of the, the mobility demands to swim butterfly are, are off the charts ridiculous. When you think about a symmetrical motion um, that takes you to an extreme of extension, and then as you try to pull through the water, that, that you have to to achieve the opposing position and uh um, a lot of them can't do that so again it's, it's kind of like i was talking about earlier in the call that you've got you've got a body that that wants to stay in in at one end of the spectrum of respiration and then they find a way to do the opposite which is a compensatory activity and now you're driving all sorts of of compensations but they have to increase mobility to achieve these positions, like again, butterfly, you're always going to see the the hypermobility in, in the shoulder girdle, um, but but maybe they're picking up in the clavicle, maybe because of the way that they have to breathe and the degree of fatigue that they're going to use a lot of ex accessory muscle activity for respiration that's going to drive elements of that. And so again, you know, I I don't think it I don't. I don't think any diagnosis is all that special. I think that your tests are going to point you in the right direction as long as you can identify what's really going on. So, 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 so let's think about just that, that upper area and all the potential influences. So you've got the manubrium and then ribs one and two that attach to the manubrium. So, so that, that tends to, to per perform and behave as a, as a interesting little unit of activity because it's directly associated with, with scalenes, which now gets you into the cervical spine. The first rib is not a synovial joint. So again, that moves a little bit differently. So again, we can talk about that, that segment. You can talk about the, the hypermobility that, that might be associated with an SC joint. And so you'll see that with, uh, with your pitchers. Um, and especially lefties will have a lot of um, laxity in the, in the left SC joint because they have a body that probably wants to go to the right, but they got to go back to the left. Um, so, so they're kind of going against the grain there. You'll see separations of the, of the, uh, the costal cartilage is at the sternum. So we had a, a professional, a guy who pitches for the, uh, um, I probably won't, I won't say where he pitches. Um, but we had a professional guy come in and he had a, a sternal injury from years and years ago. And it was obvious that, that you could see that the, the costal cartilage had pulled away and scarred. Um, so you got all sorts of stuff that, that influences that. And then you got all the accessory muscle tone, um, that could potentially influence, um, how much, uh, airflow they can get into the upper thorax. So again, you have to look at how they move air, where do they create the most pressure? How do they create, um, an inhalation and how do they create an exhalation? Because I've seen the thoracic outlet symptoms in people that are stuck at either end of the spectrum. And so it doesn't matter which one it is. It's, it's the resultant of all these things that potentially influence this position. But I'd start looking at, at clavicles, um, some of the neck uh, accessory musculature, the position of the first and second ribs, and then the position of the sternum. And, um, you know, a couple of clues as to how they're getting air out 
the sternum will actually bend at the, at the junction where the sternum meets the manubrium. And so you can have, you know, a, 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 a manubrium that's, that's tilted up as if they were inhaling and a sternum that's pulling down as if they're exhaling. And, and so again, that's somebody that's creating a heck of a lot of pressure in the upper thorax. And then you think, well, how are they getting air in then if, if the sternum is not coming up to let air in, what is doing it? Now you've got accessory muscle activity that's pulling those upper ribs upward. And if they trap against the first rib, you've closed that space off. I can also have the same thing happen for somebody that has a full bucket handling up of the sternum, and that's going to bring those ribs up anyway. And so again, you have, you have different positions in the upper thorax that are driving the same symptom pattern. So you, you, you still have to default to your test. I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily turn them into something special until they're sp something special. And I do hate those surgeries that they do. And if you get the guys that have the, the ribs removed and stuff, that's just a nightmare. It's a, it's a, that's a tougher management problem. Thank you, appreciate it. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, real quick, is there any way that you would diagnose the this bending of the sternal angle? Would you just notice the neck musculature and? So the bending of the sternum at the manubrium where it, where it joins the manubrium? Yeah, yeah. Um, you can see it, you can palpate it, and there's a, there's a visual represent, I mean, there's a visual representation of it. Um, that, that if I just tell you that you've got You've got a manubrium that, that's tilted at a 45 degree angle and you've got a sternum that is almost vertical. And so it bends right, at, right where it, they join together. Is there a, a normal bend to it? You would hope that it would be continuous and you would not have a bend. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so somebody, somebody that, that looks really caved in in the upper chest will, will have that. Um, really tall, um, um, really slim people. So if you look at uh, like a Christian Bale from the machinist kind of a guy, um, it's really easy to see on those kind of people. Um, but, but if you can get a picture of those, you'll, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, but anybody that, with it, that has um, extra weight on their chest, if we can say that without being offensive, um, may, may show some of that, that stuff. Um, but it causes it, it causes a whole bunch of any number of symptoms from neck stuff to to headaches to jaw pain, you know, to shoulder stuff to clavicle stuff. You pick something. I mean, it it just it's just a nasty little representation. Sure, sure, that's cool. Okay. All right, guys, thanks for coming out. Bill, nice work. Thanks for going 15 minutes over for us. Okay. John the Jedi really appreciates it. Chris the Jedi also really appreciates it. <laughs> hey, the Bruce Lee, the Bruce Lee video that's been going around with the uh, with the, the nunchucks and the lightsabers, awesome. Must see, must see. <laughs> if Bruce Lee was a Jedi, I'll I'll put the link to that in the notes so that everyone can can download that. I send I send you that video, that Batman Samurai video thing in your uh, Facebook, Bill. Oh, sweet. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. It's going to be awesome. Stephen LaFlame, real quick. Um, I saw Amy.